Tonight's guest is Vince Martin. Vince, welcome to the show. Hi, Vic. How are you? Oh, I'm doing good, but more importantly, how are you? I'm doing pretty well, considering worldwide events and uh, things of that nature. But yeah, I'm doing pretty good. Well, as long as you can say that, then yeah, something's going right. That's good. Yeah. Vince, please give us a brief bio on yourself. Okay. Well, uh, I'll be 51 in November. I work for a wastewater treatment system manufacturer in the Cleveland, Ohio area. I'm a musician, a drummer. Tried to go professional. It didn't work out like for a lot of folks, but um, I've come to grips with that. And I'm also the new president of the International Alchemy Guild. And that's pretty much my focus. And of course, sharing the dog man story is on my plate right now. And it's something I've been thinking about for, for some time. And I finally pulled the trigger on it. And here we are tonight. Well, I'm sorry to hear that it's on your plate, but considering the fact that it is, I'm glad you contacted me so we could do the best we could to deal with that. You have an interesting ritual you follow on Friday nights, Vince, while you're listening to new episodes of the show. What can you tell us about it? So I get in the car. I hook up my phone to my sync system. So YouTube is coming out through the speaker system. Stop at the store, grab an iced tea or a Red Bull and wait for the Dogman Encounters episode to come on. When it does, I kick it on and I start the driving. And what I've been doing is starting to drive where my encounter happened. I suppose part of me thinks, well, hey, maybe I'll see this thing again. I don't know. But there's um, areas near that area that I feel are prime uh, habitat for these creatures. And I say that because I've looked at Google Earth. There's plenty of water, plenty of open field space for maybe running after things and plenty of cover too. So I kind of think or secretly hope that they are there, but hearing a lot of your stories from other folks, I don't actually want to encounter one the way they have. I just kind of have this thing. I want to see it again. Like a lot of folks do and a lot of folks don't, but that's my ritual. Nine o'clock I'm out driving around and exploring at night and you don't really see too much but i'm just hoping something will jump out in the road i guess and uh, when the show's over head back home and pretty much just go to bed at that point because it's you know i usually get up early even on the weekends but that's the ritual wow so you hop into the car and you drive around creepy spots where you think there might be dog men listening to the show that takes guts <laughs> <laughs> I do keep the windows rolled up, though, because when I get into my story, you'll you'll know why. But um, I haven't gone that far yet as to keeping the windows down because uh, there's just something not letting me do that. I'm just not wanting anything to jump in and become a passenger, if you will. No, I don't blame you there. No, I can fully understand why you would keep the windows up. It's funny you mentioned doing that because about five years ago, there was a listener who contacted me to let me know about this ritual that he would do whenever a new episode of the show would come on on Friday night. He told me that he lived way out in the sticks and every Friday night he would hop into a side-by-side -side and then he would go way out onto the back outskirts of his property. I guess there was like a pond or that's where there was the edge of a lake or something like that. And he would sit in the dark right there by the pond or by the lake and the woods are right there nearby. He would just shut the engine down and sit there and see if he could listen to the whole episode without getting freaked out and heading for the house. Well, it's funny because a couple of times he sent me a message to let me know, yeah, Vic, you got me. I had to fire up the razor and head back for the house. That show was just too creepy. So it's not just you as rituals like that. Well, that guy is certifiable because I don't think I would want to sit in a an open vehicle and just sit a, as a, a waiting duck, or whatever that phrase is, a sitting duck in water or whatever, waiting for something like that to creep up on me. That guy's got a lot of guts, but my hat's off to him. He's doing something he wants to do, and I think that's pretty cool. 
Yeah, I don't think he frightens very easily, that's for sure, to do something like that. When you contacted me, you described the dogman you saw as being a werewolf. Do you still think it was a werewolf, or do you think it's a dogman now? I think it's a dogman. So you have to understand, at the time, I never heard the term dogman. But I've, of course, heard the term werewolf. But I never subscribed to, uh, I guess you could say, werewolf by definition, meaning shape-shifting, a human shape-shifting into an animal. You know, bones have to crack or bend and fur has to grow and then all that stuff has to reverse back into a human i'm not saying it doesn't happen or can't happen because i don't have the credentials to say something like that i just at this point don't believe it i didn't believe it then however when i saw it it i mean there's no no other way to describe it but a werewolf i mean because i know what wolves look like of course i think most people do and um it wasn't somebody's german shepherd i've been around those kind of in fact i've had a dog i had a german shepherd when i was younger so yeah i mean to me it looked like a werewolf yeah it's hard to think of a better way to describe what you saw i mean that's what they look like so yeah that's only right. natural if werewolves do exist do you think it would have been better if it really was a dog man instead of a werewolf that's a pretty stinking good question i would say I would say I'd rather it be a dog man than a werewolf. And I can say why, because if a werewolf is anything like the Hollywood werewolf, I don't want a piece of that. So I'm thinking I'd go with the dog man. I'll pick that. Yeah, that's what I thought you'd say. I think that's a pretty good way to answer it. What kind of effects did your encounter have on your worldview? It shattered my worldview. Because, uh, I mean, I never believed in werewolves. It was fun to watch the movies and see people dress up like them at you know, Halloween time and trick or treat and all that good stuff. But when that comes into reality, then it, it, it screws with your mind. It screwed with mine. And I didn't know what to make of it. My worldview changed. Well, that's only natural. That's something I get really frustrated about, Vince. I'm going to kind of hop onto my soapbox here. When I started airing episodes of the show years ago, most of the comments were centered around trying to help the eyewitness who was featured on that show. But it kind of devolved into first, I'm first, and comments like it's almost like a nightclub or something like that. Here we've got someone who's burying their soul talking about their lives being turned upside down, and you've got responses like that in the comments section for the videos. I was half tempted more than once to just close down the comments section and not allow people to comment. The whole purpose of the show was to help eyewitnesses who have the courage to come on and talk about these horrible experiences they've had that they never asked to have in the first place. They're looking for help by coming on and bearing their souls, sharing this traumatic experience they've had that's so difficult to talk about in so many cases. And the best people who are listening to the show can do is talk about how what they're having to eat that night and how much fun it is to sit and listen to the show. Oh, I'm going to get my scare on. I'm really disappointed by that. Dogman Encounters is all about helping these eyewitnesses. It's not about a club or a party or anything like that. Please keep that in mind if you are going to leave a comment for the show. Wow, I got kind of worked up there, didn't I? Oh, well. All right, Vince, please tell us about your encounter now. Give us every last detail that comes to mind. Okay, so my story begins in the summer of the mid-90s. I didn't really bother to remember a specific date because, frankly, I rather wanted to put the event behind me. However... I'm leaning toward the event transpiring in 1997, but I have nothing to back that up. I just remember where I was living at the time and that it was summertime. And of course, it was nighttime around 10 p.m. And the sky was uh, brightly lit up by the moon. I don't know if it was a full moon. I don't know, but it was bright. And the area I was in 
there's a lot of tree cover. So you get sporadic beams of light that come through as you drive through, which is nice. But I couldn't sleep that night. So I decided to take a summer nighttime drive with the windows down, uh, thinking that the fresh air and the drive itself would allow me to relax enough to get get some sleep before, you know, before I returned home. So I drove to a natural spring water area and parked my car. I took a plastic cup that I had in the car. It might have been an old Taco Bell cup or McDonald's or something. I don't remember, but I took that. I filled it up with spring water and I sat on a stone wall that was there. There was one street light and it was above uh, shining just left to center, I guess you could say. So I wasn't sitting in the dark and I didn't want to do that anyway. Uh, this natural spring, it spilled into an old stone horse trough from a pipe that was tapped into an underground spring. So people years ago, years and years ago, probably before cars, I'm assuming, they used to take their horse rides, horseback riding through that area they'd stop there and give their horses a drink they probably drank some too there's a place there called the holdem arboretum and it's what it sounds like it's an, it's an arboretum a big big acres and acres of trees different varieties and things but they're apparently in charge of this spring water area and they cited high bacterial counts and eventually capped off that spring a handful of years ago. So my drives there really didn't mean too much anymore. And I had no reason to go out there after they capped it off. So this spring, it was located on Wisner Road in Kirtland, Ohio, between Mentor Road and Mitchell's Mill Road. So I finished that cup of water. I filled it up again for the trip home and got back in my car. I decided to take a different route home than the route I took to get to the spring. I began driving. I turned right, went over the bridge that crosses over the east branch of the Chagrin River. This is Mitchell's Mill Road. The road takes me uphill, winding first to the left, then straight for a couple hundred feet, then a gradual turn to the right. This is the stretch with the longest part of the incline I was on. The speed limit there is about, I think it's 25 miles an hour. And I'm sure at this point, I'm not quite going 25 miles an hour because of the incline. So I'm starting to level off now. And ahead of me, I see this very black shape, black as carbon at a mailbox on the right side of the road, the passenger side of the car. Uh, the mailbox is on a property that's in Chardon Township. This is in Geauga County. As I get closer, that shape begins taking on a form. I'm almost on top of it now, and I see what I can only describe as a crouching werewolf. I say to myself, what the heck? That's a werewolf. But I don't recall if I uttered this out loud or not. I have no idea. My headlights are on it. And I clearly see that this is indeed a living thing. That's how I felt. I don't know why I thought it was a living thing, but it sure looked alive to me. But it's not paying attention to me in the least bit. It's staring directly across the street at something. I'm now passing the creature. And if you can see the mailbox at the edge of the road, you'd understand that the muzzle of this creature was very close to my car. So the, the line on the side of the road is just right at that mailbox, an old country road. And... If there was a passenger in my car, that passenger could have reached out and grabbed its muzzle. That's how close I was to it. And it had been no effort. I'm terrified. I was instantly terrified. 
And I've never experienced fear on that level before or since. I was so frightened, I couldn't think to swerve to the left to avoid being so close to it. I was somewhat frozen. As I'm passing the creature, something inside didn't allow me to look directly face on. My head stayed forward while my eyes strained to look to the right to get a peek at this thing. I wasn't successful. But now that I've passed the creature, I didn't speed up because part of me wanted to see if what I saw was actually a werewolf. It just didn't, just didn't make sense to me. These things don't exist. What am I seeing? It's not a dog. It's not a bear or whatever. It looks like a Hollywood werewolf to me. I didn't see eyes. I saw from the shoulders down again, it was crouching like a catcher in baseball, Johnny bench, if you will. But I wasn't focusing on the bottom part of the body. You know, when I was creeping up to it, I could just see that big old head. So if you know the size of a mailbox, say where a newspaper would go into those standard mailboxes, I'll tell you later in the story, but I, I went there. I crouched where it crouched. My wife took a photo and looking at the photo of me there, I can see where in comparison to me that its head was just above mine and its snout muzzle, whatever you want to call it was past the mailbox. Just a crazy big thing. I'm six foot, 330 pounds. I carry the weight well. I'm not a sloppy fat guy, but I'm big guy. And its head just dwarfed me. Again, I couldn't see a, the torso or anything. I just saw black, carbon black, and the ears, of course. Um, its mouth wasn't open. Didn't see any teeth. This thing was focused across the street at something. So I maintained speed. And I tapped my brakes just enough to engage the brake lights, but not enough to slow down the car. With my right foot on the gas pedal and my left foot on the brake pedal, I was able to look in my rear view mirror with the help of the brake lights to see if it was chasing me down or moving around or whatever. I didn't see anything and came to a stop sign. Here at this stop sign, I can only go left or right. The road dumps into Sperry Road. The Holdem Arboretum is just in front of me. I stop the car and try to get my head wrapped around what the heck just happened. So I decided that I'm going to make a loop around the area and drive back to see if I can see the creature again. This time, mentally prepared for what I'll see. So, so I think. So. I go to make that right turn and realize that my hands are white knuckle glued to the steering wheel. I had no idea this was happening. That's from that fear before. That's from that adrenaline. So there was a mild effort to release my grip of that steering wheel. So I'm just past the stop sign, nose of the car partially on Sperry Road, and the tail, the trunk, the bumper is partially on Mitchell's Mill Road. I shake my hands a bit and begin my loop around. I make my loop taking Sperry Road to Booth Road, then to Baldwin Road, to Hart Road, to Little Mountain Road, to Mentor Road, and make my right turn on to Wisner Road. Again, this is where that, that spring is, where that trough was. I make my way past the spring water area, back on the Mitchell's Mill Road, and begin my slow descent back up to that mailbox. I would say that loop probably took 12, 15 minutes, maybe 12 minutes or so to, to get back around there. And uh, I'm probably driving about 10 miles an hour at this point. My high beams are on now. Now, I should mention that they weren't on, the high beams weren't on during the encounter because 
as I mentioned previously, the moon was out and bright. I really didn't need them. Um, but this time they're on. I want to see everything. So I see the mailbox, but no creature gone, which was a relief in, in a way because I didn't know if I really saw this thing. I mean, I knew I saw it, but something inside wasn't, wasn't allowing me to register. Yeah, you saw a creature. Well, when this thing's gone and that black carbon shape is gone, okay, there was something there and now it's not. So you did see something. Uh, so what I had witnessed was real. So I'm glad I decided to return and see that something was indeed there originally. I had to do this because the rational part in me said there's no such things as werewolves. Yet I saw one. So think, thinking on this, I don't believe my fear came from the creature itself, as in it being able to produce that kind of emotion in me. I simply believe that my worldview of fiction and myth suddenly became reality, and it shook me to the core. I return home. I go to bed with the intention of getting up early and driving back out to that site in the daytime with plenty of light. I do just that. And when I get to the mailbox, I look to my left to try to understand what the creature was looking at and see it's just an ordinary open field. But I, I kind of knew that anyway, because getting the spring water, it's not my first time doing this. I've, I've done it a lot. I, I suffer from insomnia on occasion. And I used to take these drives all the time, not just there, other places, but I've gone to this area I'm talking about tonight many times. I do remember seeing a field, but now that I'm there uh, the next morning, it's definitely a field. So I don't know what it was looking at at this point. But I, I couldn't understand at the time what fixated the creature. I never told anybody what I saw until many years later and really didn't think about it in much detail unless I was in that area. It didn't jump up at me or attack me or anything like that. So there, there was no, not so much, there was no PTSD about it, but the worldview thing did make me start thinking in different directions, I guess you could say. Um, again, just a docile creature from what I saw at that moment. So, I'll fast forward now to 2011. I'm married now, had been since, uh, since 2004. I'm still married. I never yet shared my encounter with my wife. She had a mild but growing interest in Bigfoot. And I, too, have always been fascinated with the, that subject as well as UFO phenomena. We find out there's going to be a Bigfoot UFO conference in Pennsylvania. I don't remember where we found this out. We found out and got the tickets and just thought it would be fun to attend. Uh, so we get there, but we couldn't make day one due to a prior commitments elsewhere. The event was called the 2011 PA UFO Bigfoot Con. It was held at the Science Building at Westmoreland County Community College in Youngwood, Pennsylvania, on October 22nd through 23rd. We attended day two, October 23rd. This is the Bigfoot portion of the conference. This is when we first met Dr. Jeffrey Meldrum and Stanton Friedman, among other folks. And Mr. Friedman primarily is tied to the UFO community, but he stuck around for day two in hopes of selling more of his books in the vendor area. And it worked. We bought some. Uh, so my wife and I arrive early and decide to go in and browse the vendor tables. I eventually come up to a table of a vendor by the name of Dave Dragosin. He is the Western Regional Director of the Pennsylvania Bigfoot Society and creates first person witness forensic style sketches. 
He has a three ring binder on his table loaded with his sketches. And I began flipping through these pages, making small talk with him as I go. I suddenly come across a werewolf sketch. It was crouching and facing the same direction as the creature I saw. Everything came flooding back to memory as I just stared at that picture. It just snapped back into my mind. Hadn't thought about it in a long time. And all of a sudden, there it is. It's almost as if he took a picture through my mind. It was a strange thing. So I, I quickly realized what I'm doing and that Dave is looking intently at me. I don't see him do it. I could feel him doing it. It's my peripheral. I could see him do it, I guess you could say. I feel he's going to ask me if I had an encounter with this thing due to my reaction to his sketch. Thankfully, another person came over to the table and started chatting with him. And I quickly slipped out of sight to avoid talking. It seems I'm not the only one to see this type of creature. I guess werewolves do exist. And I've always heard that there's a scrap of truth in myth and legend. So I'm thinking, okay, I'm not the only one. Other people that has gone to actually report their sighting. I never talk about it and they're out there doing it. He's taking sketches. Cool. It's very cool, but it was a freaky thing to come rushing back. Something I didn't expect. I, I didn't go over there for that. I went there to, you know, see UFOs, Bigfoot, people talking, all that stuff. And there's a dog, man. So it's crazy. And I should say too, that I don't think he called it. I don't think he labeled it dog, man, or werewolf. I don't think it was just a picture. So still not at the point of hearing the word dog man yet in, in my memory. So now we have the cryptid UFO convention bug. And my wife likes to say that she's a Bigfoot enthusiast enthusiast. So that's where she sits with that. I mean, she still thinks it's cool and all that. So we begin looking around for other conferences. We find one to attend at Salt Fork State Park here in Ohio for May 18th through 20th, 2012. The event is called Creature Weekend. And we try to attend this annual event when we can. And uh, the COVID pandemic's kind of screwed some things up <laughs> for that. But we try to. And one of the speakers that weekend was Linda Godfrey talking about something called the Michigan Dogman. Now, I don't recall ever hearing this woman's name prior to the event. And I certainly never heard of a creature called Michigan Dogman. And in fact, I thought the name Dogman was ridiculous. I thought, dang, I mean, are people running out of good ideas on what to call unknown creatures? I thought it was silly. So, you know, when we were attending Linda's presentation, I went in with an attitude that this woman is probably a person just trying to sell books, period. And I know that sounds disrespectful, especially now when I know that that's the wrong thing to say about her. But I didn't know her from Adam. I didn't know anything about her. I must have really tuned out during her presentation because I only vaguely recall the content of her presentation. The important thing here and why I even bring up any of this, I wasn't making the connection between her subject matter and my encounter. I wasn't open to it simply because of the word dog man. Okay, so it's now 2016. Once again, it's Creature Weekend at Salt Fork State Park in Ohio, June 3rd through 5th. And if any of you listening have never gone to it, you should check it out. I know the guy who puts it on, Bruce Harrington. I don't know. I guess check your Facebook, check things out if he's going to have something when the pandemic burns out. But it's a cool time. It's fun. It's fun time. Everybody's like a little family there. It's pretty cool. But on the last day of the event, we all gathered for some food, hot dogs, hamburgers, before we parted ways for another year. My wife and I secured a table and a couple of amateur film guys sat down with us to chat about the weekend's events. One of the guys mentioned he lives in Maine. I don't recall where he said he lived, but 
I'd asked him if he heard of the television show called Paranormal Witness. I went on to say that there was an episode called The Wolf Pack, and it was loosely based on a family in Palmyra, Maine. I've seen the episode a few times over the years, and even though I know that there was some poetic license involved, I still enjoyed it. I could watch it now and still enjoy it. It's just kind of a freaky thing. He never heard of it, but said he didn't live far from the area of Palmyra. He went on to say that there was a Dogman conference coming in two months called the Dogman Symposium, and that was held in Defiance, Ohio, on August 5th and 6th of 2016. My wife and I attend day two, and it's not until much later after this event that I told my wife my story of the Dogman. At some point, I tell my wife of the werewolf encounter for two reasons. One reason is that I can now share the story with someone because that sketch I saw back in 2011 somewhat validates what I saw as in, I'm not the only one. And the other reason is so that I can hear myself talk about it out loud. And this enables me to begin looking into this cryptid in other ways, other than television shows. So try to look at things on, on the internet and books and different things. So I started getting a little bit more serious about it. On June 1st of 2019, my wife and I take a drive to that mailbox I spoke about earlier. And I show her the field across the street where that thing was looking intently at something. It's no longer a big field. In fact, you know, getting up to the mailbox, it still looks the same. There's houses set back from the road. Some of them are so far set back, you can't see them. You just see the driveway. It's a country road. No street lights to speak of in that area on the road, but still beautiful. Nice, nice for taking country drives and, and things like that. Just, in fact, we were there a handful of months ago and there was a a drunk guy on a golf cart uh, getting in trouble by the police and this was what i call my my dog man drive my little ritual that we talked about earlier so on friday nights i tell my wife i'm going to my dog man drive and she knows what i mean well right there by the mailbox probably 50 feet away this guy in a golf cart and his cops are doing whatever they're doing and I started getting a little freaked out. I'm thinking, this dude's in a tiny little golf cart. And if this dog man's around here, this guy's toast. Simple as that, you know. But anyway, so we got around all that. And uh, we're driving into daytime. Sure, the field. It's no longer a field, but rather a piece of property the Hold'em Arboretum used upon to build their uh, service garage. So there's a little piece, a little chunk of property, and then the rest is this service garage. So the field really is gone. Without missing a beat, she instantly says, well, that creature was probably hunting deer. And I, I'm like, well, I guess you're right, because I don't know why that didn't occur to me decades ago, but for whatever reason. But I believe she's absolutely right, because the whole Tri-County area is loaded with deer. We got Lake County, Geauga County, Ashtabula County, up here in Northeast Ohio, just loaded with them. Lots of food. If, it's, if that's what they eat, these dogmen, then there's plenty of food for them. So a couple of months before this, before going and taking my wife to show her this mailbox area, I stumbled on your podcast on a Roku TV app called Cryptovania TV. And I listened to all that they had to offer on that little app. And then I moved over to your YouTube channel and, and subscribed. And uh, I've been hesitant to talk. I've heard of all these excellent stories. And I'm not trying to compare my story to anyone else's. I realize my story is very subdued. There's not much going on there in comparison to other people's things. So I think there was some of that going on where, you know, I'm just going to wait this out until the time is right, whatever that means, you know? And um, 
I think that was the just a, a gripping fear. I kind of didn't want to live again, I guess. I knew because it kind of came back uh, when I saw that sketchbook and I kind of didn't want it, those feelings rising up again. So I don't know. It was just gripping fear. I can't even explain it. And anyway, I think a lot of your listeners out there know what I'm talking about with gripping fear. And again, I'm a big guy. Nothing scares me. I can get spooked or surprised just like the next guy, but actual fear and getting scared, it just doesn't happen. But that happened. And because it happened and because my worldview changed, it's something that is a kind of a sensitive area. But again, so I don't know, I feel my story is a little different in this area with the fear because I don't believe the creature itself caused the fear initially. I feel it was more of me realizing that fiction and myth came to life, as I mentioned earlier. Understand something, Vince. Every eyewitness deals with their encounter in a different way. Obviously, all these encounters are different, so there's no call to really say that your encounter wasn't as frightening as the next one or whatnot. I mean, they're all frightening for the most part. You've never had such an experience before in your life, and you never asked to have that experience. You're just dealing nope. with this experience the best way you know how. So yeah, right. that's all there is to it. It is what it is. And as long as you're doing the best you can to deal with it in a healthy way, then yeah, nothing yeah. else matters. You told me you were driving home using a route that you normally didn't take when you had your encounter. Had you ever gone that way home before? Yeah. Well, I mean, the only reason I'd gone out to the area was for the spring water. So when I was a teenager, and even my my grandfather used to go out there to fill up his uh, plastic milk jugs, you know, fill a ton of them up. A lot of people did that and put them in their trunk and go home. I knew about the area. And when I got my driver's license, it was one of the first places I went to. And uh, there's a lot of big houses, the ones you can't see anyway. Like I said, a lot of them are set back. There's big money out there, a lot of um, wealthy people out there. And the Holdem Arboretum kind of monitors all that or patrols it. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I've gone through there many, many, many times coming back from, say, Chardon proper. There's the Chardon Township where the encounter happened, and there's Chardon Village, which is now a city or whatever. So, I, on the way back from Chardon, I'll take all the back roads. And a lot of times I'll go past the area that I'm talked about tonight. And, um, there's only been a handful of times. And in fact, with, with my ritual, the dog man drive, where I tell her, yeah, I'm going on the dog man drive and I get my drink, get the phone hooked up to the car, dog man episodes playing, I'm driving. It's like, I don't want to go there. And I wind up driving around where, where things are well lit and, but still looking around. I, I try to go some back roads, but going right to that area. Maybe three times I had, I just was spooked to go. And it's probably the times I should have gone, but I just, I couldn't get myself to do it. Just for whatever reason, didn't want to do it. So yeah, I've gone through there, come and going many, many times. Well, like I told you before, it takes a lot of guts to do what you did. Going yeah. back after having that experience, that couldn't have been easy. When you took your wife past that spot where you saw the werewolf, as you put it, did she have her window rolled up or down? It was down. It was just last summer we did this. So um, I had one of my Hawaiian shirts on for the picture. And uh, so, yeah, it was summertime. And I don't think she would dispute this. I mean, I think, and I don't blame her, that there's a part of her that just didn't believe it. But I've gone through so much, you know, with taking her there, going on my dog man drives, taking notes down and trying to remember my story and all the events leading up to this interview and actually doing the podcast with you um, that, you know, there might be some doubt in her still, but um, I don't, there, she didn't believe it a hundred percent. I don't think so. Yeah. The window's down. She's not spooked by it. Now I've taken her on those dog man drives and yes, the windows are up at night. <laughs> I've taken my sister, you know, and um, I, I tell them just, like I'm repeating tonight, you know, this is what happened. And I turned here and, and I think, yeah. So if memory serves the day that I took her to the, the mailbox, the intention to, was to go 
so I could get out of the car, get over to the mailbox, crouch down so she could snap a picture because I wanted the comparison. Well, going up that incline I was talking about earlier, right before you get up to the mailbox, I flipped on the video on my phone recorded to get a feel for that too. I don't know what I thought I'd do with the picture or the video. There's not much to it, but it was summer windows down. But like I said, nighttime. Yeah. She didn't want the windows windows down. I, I don't blame her. Considering the fact that it was daytime when you took her past there. Yeah. I can understand why you had the windows down, but at night, yeah, definitely windows up. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't blame you. And I'm so glad the dog man was focused on looking at something else and wasn't looking at you when you saw it. But speaking of what could have happened, can you imagine how much worse this whole experience would have been for you to deal with if when you slowed down to see if he was coming for you, you saw that he was? That's like a very frightening section of a horror movie. I really, Vic, I don't even know. I don't know what I would have done. I guess I would have gunned it and just... I mean, if it's something's, if he's chasing me down, I'm not going to stick around to see what he wants, of course. And these roads that I'm talking about, these country roads, they're, especially when I had to leave. So I told you about Holden Arboretum and Sperry Road. Either direction I would have went left or right is hilly and twisty and, you know, that kind of, and there's no way you can get any kind of speed without wrecking. So. Um, my understanding is these things can move a lot faster than 25 miles an hour. And that's probably as fast as I could have gone, maybe 30, 35 at the most on a stretch. But then here comes a curve and I've got to, I've got to slow down. So it's like, yeah, I don't know. I just, I just freeze. Um, I didn't have a cell phone back then. So, you know, who would I call the cops, the hold them arboretum officers? <laughs> you know, it's crazy to think about that. And I try not to, because if I start dwelling on putting scenarios in my head that didn't happen, then then that gets all gets all crazy and weird, you know. I'm just glad it didn't happen. I, I wouldn't want it to happen to anybody, but anything could happen down the road. I, I feel bad for that person already, even though it hasn't happened. For that person who that's gonna happen to here a couple of years from now, who knows? Where this thing's chasing them down and um, not slowing down. What happens? Does it bash through the back window? Does it catch up and just break a window or just climb in the window with you? Or who knows? I don't know what these things are capable of. They're very, very strange, in intriguing creatures and um, fascinating. But they should be respected. Oh, no doubt. And just think about how many people in that area might have seen that dog man also, not just you. And that's something else I've thought about. I have thought about that and have gone as far as thinking about knocking on the door of the place where I saw it, the mailbox, going down that driveway, knocking on their door. I'm not saying I would have done it, but I was heavily considering, hey, you know, I was here in the 90s and, you know, there was this thing. Have you seen anything like that since, you know, whatever? And I've thought about doing that, but then that's that whole Oh, he's one of those people. He's a freak or whatever. I think that's happening less and less often. You know, 10, 15 years ago, maybe 20, you know, you're kind of a nutcase. You fall into the wackos who are into UFOs and Bigfoot and stuff. But I think more and more people are becoming open about it, at least accepting about it. And, uh, you know, look at um, Dr. Meldrum, scientists who stand up credible people and saying, look, you know, there's dermal ridges on these things. You know, you can't fake the footprints with dermal ridges and all, all this stuff that they tell you, you know what I'm talking about. And when people like that start standing up and, and speaking for cryptids, I think more people are starting to become open to it. And I think the more open that you are to things like that, if you don't have ill intentions, I, I think you'd probably see more, more things more cryptids, maybe more dogmen. I don't know what it is that people don't see them every day. Like they see deer or crows or whatever, why these things are so elusive. I, I don't have those answers, but I think, I think more and more people are accepting them now. 
I think I just went off on a tangent there, but, um, you know, talking about this stuff is, um, it's exhilarating, fascinating. You know, I'll, I'll, I can say every adjective there is about it. It's just, um, just a creepy subject and fun to talk about, I guess. Yeah, I must be rubbing off on you, going off on tangents like that the way you did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'd say. And before going on those dogman drives that you went on, did you ever put much thought into what you would have done and how it would have affected you if it would have been there one of those times when you went back? Yeah, I've thought about it. As I mentioned earlier, I go with some internal hope that I will see it. So I have to really analyze why that is. Do I want to reinforce what I know I saw, meaning reprove it to myself that I saw this thing? I, I know something was there. I know it wasn't a natural animal that we know about, you know, dogs and things. It was this thing that everybody talk, calls a dog man. So I have that. But um, I think a bigger part of me just doesn't want to see it and i can kind of align this with fishing a little bit at least my kind of fishing so i've got a tackle box and tons of fishing poles and things and and i'll go fishing but i have no intention of catching a fish and let me explain that i'll just go i'll get away and i'll i'll, I'll get the bait you know if i'm cat fishing i'll use green shrimp and that kind of stuff and i just throw the line out there. If I don't get a fish, cool. You know, but if I get one, it's like, oh man, I got to reel it in, take it off the hook and all that other stuff. So I, I part of me hopes I don't even catch anything. I just want to sit there, chill out and everything else. So I think that's kind of what this dog man thing is. If it happens, okay, I guess I'll deal with it, but I'm kind of hoping it doesn't show up. I'm out driving. I'm listening to dog man encounters on my phone and the car, kind of a neat little ritual. And, um, that's my take on it. Well, I can appreciate the metaphor there, the way you compared the two, but what if you would have gotten a bite when you did go back to see that area? That would have been horrible. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and I don't know what I do, Vic. I just think, I guess I would try to take a picture of it. I might even be too afraid being almost 51 years old. And of course I'm a bigger guy now than I was in 97. So Getting older, you know, I could still hold my own and defend myself with people, you know, but with this thing, you know, I don't think Bruce Lee can even take this thing out. You know, it's just crazy. So, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I just hope for the best, uh, hit the gas pedal and just kind of get out of there and just say, hey, I saw another one, you know, but that's about it, really. I don't think anybody but you guys would believe it, maybe my wife, but I do think, though, if if I did see it. In, in that area. Now, these days, I would go the next day or within that week, knock on the local doors. Hey, show them my phone. This is what people call a dog man, blah, blah, blah. I just saw it. You may want to keep your kids in the house or at least be with them when they're out, keep your dogs inside, whatever, kind of warn them and maybe even talk to the, the game warden. I don't know. It, it's hard to say. I could say all that now, but if it happens, would I do any of that? Would I do more than that? It's, it's a lot of questions to think about. Oh, it is. Yeah, it is a lot to think about. Before we move on, if you've had a dogman encounter of your own and would like to speak with me about it, whether in private or on the show, either way is fine. Please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you. But having said that, it's about time for us to get out of here, Vince. But before we do, do you have any closing comments you'd like to share? Well, I think I'd like to briefly talk about how I dealt with the experience, at least in the later portion of my life. I, I'm with the Alchemy Guild, and I've, I've been studying alchemy and hermeticism. And this will tie in. I, I've been studying it for... Um, almost 10 years now. I started in 2012. And like I said, I'd like to preface what I'm about to say with this little explanation uh, of, of our reality. And I think it, it might help folks if, if they're, I think everybody here is open-minded enough. And if they, if they weren't before, 
an encounter, then they definitely are after. But I, I'd like to keep them thinking and um, keep an open mind about everything with your next encounter if you have one, or you can reflect back on the one that you had. Um, so I'm going to briefly explain my thoughts on this, how I dealt with it from a hermetic viewpoint. The old alchemical adepts insisted that the physical world we live in is really a projection of our mind. And when we look out into the world around us, we are literally looking at a hard copy of our mind. Therefore, we can say inside is outside. So before you were born, only your mind exists. You have no existence in physical reality. You have feelings. You can hear your own thoughts. You have memory, dreams, etc. You can recall scenes from your memory and interact with them to a degree. It can be suggested that this condition is like you in unity. You are just consciousness. When you're born into a physical body, you become a two thing, a body, mind. So when you get to an age where you begin focusing on your body's senses, what happens is not so much at the outside world is being recognized by your senses and that you're internalizing it. But more that your senses act like a film projector in a movie theater, projecting your mind outward, building the world around you. Your world is a projection from your mind. So we live in a world where the world we experience is a collective agreement by most of the human race, uh, what it is okay to see in the world. So everyday reality is really just a collectively agreed upon hallucination. And again, this is a hermetic viewpoint from the old adepts from thousands of years ago. I'm just using modern language. Because inside is outside, physical objects with their behaviors can tell us a great deal about the influences of those objects' mental fields. It can tell us a lot about the mental influences uh, predominating in the mind field of the environment of human activity, for example. The outside can tell us about what is going on on the inside. And that's a very basic, bare bones explanation. The cool thing is, quantum physicists are just now beginning to catch up to what the old adepts already knew and wrote about. And that is, consciousness is all there is. And matter is an interpretation of consciousness. And I'm using modern language for that. because. My experience happened too long ago to investigate whatever was going on with me at the time. I'd be hard pressed to cite anything. Once you understand things from a hermetic perspective, lingering fear just really melts away because everything happens for a reason and it's an opportunity to learn. So I can look back and say, okay, whatever was going on in my life at that time, Something from inside me allowed me to come in contact with this creature in some way. It's analogous to if you haven't seen an owl in years, for instance, and all of a sudden one appears perched on your back deck for a couple of minutes. Like, hey, what's that all about? Well, you need to recognize it, then figure out what does the owl represent, and then look inside yourself and say, okay, what's going on inside me that I need to pay attention to. So that's just what I wanted to say about that. But I'll finish one more thing where folks who see these creatures say that, you know, it's it's an evil creature and, and whatnot. And, and, and respectfully, I would say they don't understand the nature of good and evil. And again, inside is outside. So good is whatever is in alignment with unity, which includes harmony, balance, light, especially the light of conscious awareness, understanding, wisdom, and of course, love. Evil is whatever is dominated by division, which includes dysfunction, corruption, 
separation, ignorance, fear, misunderstanding, etc. So try to keep an open mind about what I'm saying here. And instead of deeming the creature evil or even good, look at what's going on in you and try to, I don't know, saying right at the moment, because it's a real creature. I mean, it's going to could kill you or whatever, but I'm saying when you reflect back a few days after that, look inside yourself, like, you know, what's going on inside me that this thing is trying to bring my awareness to. I'd say that's pretty good advice. I mean, these old alchemical adepts, they go back thousands of years. I think they knew what they were talking about. I don't know how they got the knowledge. That stuff is lost to us, but there's something to it. And again, if, if science is just now getting on board with all this stuff, well, then again, that, that backs up what I'm saying about this. I'm using modern language, modern terms, but if you keep the nature of good and evil that little thing in mind, well, then I think that would help a lot of folks too. So that's really all I had to say. That would be my closing comments on my whole experience of what brought me here tonight. Wow, I think that was about the most eloquent closing comments I've ever heard shared before. You've got some really good points there, and it's pretty clear that you've put a lot of thought into this. Whatever it takes for you to be able to deal with that experience in a healthy way, I'm all behind it, so I think that's great. But having said that, Vince, I want to thank you so much for coming on and sharing the details of that experience with us. I really appreciate it. You're very welcome, Vic. Uh, it was my pleasure, definitely my honor, and I'm glad we got together to do this. Well, that goes two ways. It's been an honor having you on. Thanks again so much. Have a great night.